Hey everyone, this is Ian with Big Rock Moto. So we want to talk about the famous KLR doohickey today. And I happen to have with me here in his own shop, uh, Eagle Mike. Mike has been my personal friend for, I think, over 20 years now and a very a valued friend to me. And he's also what I consider to be the, the most uh, expert on KLRs probably in the world just because of how many he's worked on. Uh, and how many issues he's he's dealt with with the KLR. Um, so what we want to do today is talk about uh, the doohickey. We're going to talk about what it is, why it's a problem, and the differences between the three different generations of KLRs and with a focus on as well, is the Gen 3 doohickey still a problem? So let me flip the camera around and we're going to let Mike talk us through the, the doohickey issue. Okay, so we're here with Mike and sitting next to us is the Gen 3 KLR, which we're also going to be talking about in some other videos. We've got a pile of doohickeys here in spring. So, Mike, why don't you um, just give us uh, an explanation. Pretend you're talking to somebody who doesn't know a lot about engines and mechanics and all that stuff. What is the doohickey? Okay, the doohickey adjusts the slack out of the counterbalancer system in the KLR 650 engine. It actually started as this KLR 600, actual CC's mm -hmm. 560. And what happens is since it's a single cylinder going piston going up and down, the engine vibrates a little bit and the engine runs this way. And so what Kawasaki did is they created a, a chain that runs this way in the engine and drives some weights rotating the opposite direction. And there's actually three weights. There's one on this side that looks like this. There's one on the other side behind the water pump. And there's one in the engine uh, cases, in the main cases up here and that, that's harder to see. And so, the, as everything wears, there's a clamping bolt right here, and ideally we would loosen that bolt about half a turn, and there's a spring that would rotate the doohickey, this part, and you can see there's a slot, and it would rotate this way, moving an eccentric shaft to take the slack out of the chain. So that keeps everything timed, and if there's slack in the chain, it's, it's going to go like this and cause excessive vibration and wear. And we'll, we'll talk about that. So, when Kawasaki started this system in the 600 and the early 650s through early 96, this is what the front balancer weight looked like. And you can see that there's splines in the shaft and that it would sit on the engine like this. This is a timing mark and it aligned with a mark on the shaft. And then the chain would run on here and as the, the um, engine was going this way, it would run the weight, the shaft would spin this way. And on the other end of the shaft, of course, is the other weight and the water pump, okay? So this is an assembly. This has all the parts of the early ones. And you can see that there's a little wear on the, the side plates on the chain actually run on the rubber. The, the rollers don't run down in the bottom of the teeth, but you can see there's some side plate marks there. Okay, and this is what it looks like when it's not fully assembled. The sprocket is a separate part from the weight. So that's, the, and then Kawasaki improved this in mid-96, and they went to a one-piece weight, and these these parts are still used today and the current one in the 22 can be actually be retrofit all the way back into the 1984 okay. 600 now the problem is is if this if the factory doohickey and spring is used slack develops in the system and that results in excessive wear then that's the key point, is that it's not going to tension the chain properly and you're going to have components over time uh, wearing out or, at the worst case, having really catastrophic damage at some point. So, Mike, we want to talk about uh, the different generations of KLR. So, um, KLR has three main generations now. They had the Gen 1, which was 87 to 06, 07. no, 07. Gen 2 was 08 to, when was the last year they sold the Gen 18. 2? 18. And now we have the Gen 3 bike, which is 2022 and on. So why don't you walk us through the differences? So if someone owns, depending on what generation they own, what do they need to know? Okay. Well, first of all, if you have an early Gen 1, that's 87 to 90 or 87 to 89, 
you'll have a stamped doohickey and this doesn't even have all the pieces left there's an <laughs> adjustment arc on here but you can see that this one the flats it's supposed to have flats like this yeah and they've been worn out and the the rail that for the adjustment arc actually broke off so this is the early gen one version. okay now here we have a collection of the um this is the later gen one and this was used from 90 through 2007 and you can see that they're not super great sometimes the weld didn't hold well and the collar broke off sometimes the here's one where the collar broke off here's one where the collar broke here's a bunch of broken collars here's one where the rail broke off again so for so, people who think this is internet hype here's the proof that it isn't here's one you can see the spring went where it should not be here's one where you can see the chain was running on the spring here's another one like that of course the end of it's broken off so it won't properly tension which is another whole nother issue here's another one where it got where it should not be so if any of this stuff and there it's really rare that you have catastrophic failure there's a couple of things that can happen if this gets in the trans transmission catastrophic failure and what Sometimes a little piece of this will break off. Let's see if I can find one with, a, I don't see any little pieces. Um, and you can see that this one's been hit by something and had yeah. had a corner sheared off. So sometimes these break and smaller piece breaks off. Yeah, there you go, thank you. Um, and this, you don't know anything happened. It falls down in the bottom of the engine. Okay, it's just laying in there in the oil. And then you go dirt riding and you fall over. And you pick the bike up and you start the bike and you start going down the road and it's no longer in the nook and cranny where it was mm -hmm. it gets bounced up into the transmission or chain and breaks a gear that's happened a few times okay more, well more than a few but i know of a few now um sometimes the spring breaks and it would go between the balancer sprocket and the chain and that causes catastrophic damage or the spring can break and go between the cam chain and the and the cam chain sprocket on the transmission or i mean the crankshaft and when that happens the cam jump time right so once in a while you just lose three teeth and usually three teeth doesn't bend the valves but if it jumps a little more than that you bend the intakes and that's okay. happened a few times that I know of personally. So I mean, these I, these broken levers are mostly an issue on the um, the Gen One bikes, right? Because it's a two piece uh, lever, right? Right. And I, I without I won't. I mean, I suspect there's a couple reasons the welding wasn't great, and um, you know maybe they didn't normalize it after the welding and. And a lot of people, and myself included, when I first started messing with this stuff, I didn't think that there would be that much strain. I thought that this little two millimeter thick stamped piece would be plenty. Yeah. Because everything's spinning the right way, right? Well, no. And the, the, what happens is when the piston fires, it puts all that momentum onto the crankshaft. And if there's slack in the chain from the system not adjusting, it's going to yank all that slack out at once yeah. and it's going to put a load on this guy. I get it. And when that happens, that's when you get broken stuff. Now, this is a this this is the lever that started out in Gen 2 in 08. And these are an investment cast part and the material's a lot better. Yeah, so but, let's show that. So it's an improvement. Yeah. But they still can break and and I don't agree with the the design here. You can tell that the cross section the way it is and um, I've had a, a number of people this one a guy sent me and I've got one that's cracked at one end or the other and um, sometimes a piece cracks out and what happens is they're clamping it against the aluminum and if that cast surface isn't smooth and flat and if this isn't smooth and flat it it creates a, a, a skewed pressure you know in there yeah. And being an investment casting with a grain structure, it could break. And so the Gen 2s usually don't break, but they can. Okay. And now the, the Gen 1s, you can see that we, you know, we've had a bunch of springs break. And even a Gen 2 spring like this, um, you can tell it's been where it shouldn't be. That's a Gen 2 spring. And 
This is common all the way through 2022. And the most common failure is that it's, the system simply won't adjust. The spring ran out of tension and it just won't adjust. The other thing that contribute to that is since it's a cast surface that this is being tightened into, it embosses the lever into that cast surface and it's going to be stuck. And so unless you open up the case and actually tap on it, even if the spring's pulling on it, it won't adjust. So we so, just so we just did this Gen 3 this morning and we shot a video about how to do the Duicky on the Gen 3. So what did we find in this motor which only has 500 miles on it? So this one has the same parts as the 28-2, which is the same as all the Gen 2. Yeah. And the adjustment bolt was about where this one is, where this shows breaking. So it was the travel was over half used. Yeah. And the, t the spring in this bike had almost no tension left. I, I could easily remove it with my fingers. Yeah, and I'll put a video of that here because we just shot all that video. You know. Extension spring, and you can see as this moves just a little bit, it wouldn't take much, and this would be completely out of tension. You can see a little bit of space in the coils there, but down at this end, there's no space, and there's there's maybe eh, 15, 20 thousandths at this end. And Let me close in on this and try to show people what we're talking about. So this this is the factory spring. Right. Okay, and look how you see there's really, it's not really providing enough tension. And as the bike ages and the chain stretches, it's not gonna be able to tension the chain. At all. Right? right. So that's why we're, that's one of the reasons we're doing this upgrade. Would you say the spr on the Gen 3 and the Gen 2 bikes, the spring's probably more the important part of the upgrade than the actual lever itself? Yes. Okay. The, the advantage of the torsion spring is it pulls the slack out correctly. The extension spring can never get all the slack out because of the way the linkage and the play right. and all the parts So the replacement work. parts that, that are, um, I know you have one here, oh, somewhere, is a torsion spring. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, we'll put paste in a torsion yeah. spring here, I'll show one. Yeah. In fact, yeah, there, here's, the, here's the, the spring we just took out of the bike. So this literally just came out of, of this Gen 3 right here. And you want to grab the lever out of there too, please? And we'll show you the stock lever from the, the Gen 3. So you can see that this is exactly the same part yeah. as this one. This is out of an earlier Gen 2. And you can see it's the same part. So, um, so here's my question, Mike, for the average person out there. So what if someone has a KLR, whether it's a Gen 2 or the new Gen 3, and they, don't, they choose not to do anything about it? What's... What's likely to happen, and then what's also the worst case scenario for those people? Well, if you don't put any miles to speak of on your bike, you're going to be okay if you stay under 5,000 miles. Okay. Excessive wear is going to start somewhere about four or 5,000. I always like to tell people to be sure to replace it before 5,000. Okay. Um, depending on how you ride and if you adjust it, um, you can get excessive wear. Now I've had a couple of guys have catastrophic wear um, at under 12,000 miles. I had one guy at about 11,500 and another guy at 10,800. And what happened was too much slack developed in the chain. So, and he, he had been back to the dealer three times because he thought it vibrated too much. And the dealer told him, they all do that. And I know we've all heard that from the dealer, right? They yeah. all do that, famous thing. We should, they TA, DT. They all do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, basically, if you get if you get too much slack in the chain, okay, it fails to adjust because your spring run out of tension, okay, you're going to get excessive wear on the rubber. And so here you can see there's some chewed up rubber here, and that creates slack, more slack in the system because the um, it won't the chain's running on a smaller sprocket yeah okay and you can see take a look right there see that's it's pretty much gone the rubber's completely gone yeah and and the, the chain will actually at some point start rubbing on the case okay and did you want to show us something noisy. on this one here yeah and so here we have an 08 engine and um so this is from a 2008, a Gen 2 bike. But um, this one was run for a while. There's a couple things to look at. You can see that it was run with the stock lever because the edge of it here is thinner than mine. 
and it was run with the lever you loose can see for a that. bit. Yeah, right here. We call it in the trade. We call these witness marks because you can witness what's going on. Yeah. But what that caused is you can see you see all that wobble on. Yeah, the, yeah. That's a horrible amount of wobble yep. on the spline. It's not supposed to do that. And so right. then when you do end up putting tension on the on the chain, and you can see how far this thing the, I can't even push it far enough to take all the slack out. Um, this. It, it would be wobbling like this because the yeah. chain and if we take a look at this is another thing we ought to look at but you can see, see it's just it's just that would be really noisy you'd hear a lot of right. knocking in that so i just have one last question for you mike then why in your opinion has kawasaki they they are somewhat aware of this issue why have they not done anything about it i think it's a money thing it would cost a fair amount of money to retool and fix this problem and they have very few claims under warranty the average klr really doesn't average klr guy doesn't put that many miles on his bike we're still yeah. finding people buying 03 and 05 bikes with 3500 miles on them today and this is september of 2021 so it's you know they don't have almost any warranty claims on this and it, it just doesn't make sense but if you're going to ride your klr a lot you want to fix this and and there's one and Ian, you can edit this in if you want at some point. Um, you can see that the here's where the sprocket is, and and the splines are out here on this end of it. So all the pressure from the chain is pulling right here, but the the actual fitment is here. So it's going to try to cock this a little bit. And if Kawasaki had made this part fit the shaft you know, just fit the outside of the shaft within a couple thousandths or a thousandth, you, we wouldn't get that spline wear and wobble, mm -hmm. you know, and there, there's been a few of these with that are soft and maybe the shafts are soft. And if people don't, um, again, and if you look in here, you can just see this, this, uh, the rubber is all gone. It's just here. So this, this one would end up being very noisy and, and wobbling. Right. So it's it's an accounting thing that they're not they're not getting enough warranty claims or enough cost on their end or liability to warrant them fixing you know doing something about this. So it's just a balancing thing with their money, right? That's that's the reason why they haven't done anything about that's it. That's what I believe. Because they told the journalists at the press launch last week that that was their reason that they just didn't have enough warranty bills to justify doing it. So they're basically saying it's it's an accounting issue, right? Um, for them. Well. All the guys with a lot of miles on there, pretty much, I mean, I've, I've heard of one guy that had an early Gen 1, and he didn't adjust his, and he, he got a lot of miles on it, I don't know how many, but Wattman has the most miles on on his bike of anybody I know of. Yeah. He still has the stock balancer chain, and cam chain, and weights, and rings, and piston, and he's got over 185,000 miles and that's miles not kilometers for right. people watching in other countries yeah On so that's that's pretty crazy so KLR so in your opinion would a klr engine go that long without preventative fixes and things like that like the duicky and things like that i don't think so i think there's two things he did he did regular maintenance he did the doohickey early on with a torsion spring and he did the designed and built the thermobob and that yeah. keeps his cylinder round right yeah, the thermal lab we're going to have to talk about in another video, but that just helps the temperature regulate better, which is still an issue with the Gen 3s. So yep. you're still going to want to get the thermal bob on the Gen 3. Okay, well, thanks, Mike, for walking us through the doohickey uh, issue. Is there anything else you want to talk about on the, on the subject? I think that's it for the doohickey that I can remember right now. Okay. Thank you, Mike, for making time for us. To make the install of the outer case easier is I'm going to just crack this loose half a turn that's all and you can see that the, the spring pulls on that just a little bit and you could also see that that thing has about 120 degrees or so maybe a little more a little less of rotation and and that gives this thing a lot more travel than that factory lever with the factory spring. yeah for sure now this is captured on 